Hello everyone, sorry for the uh, difficult subject matter for our first video lecture, but um, I, I do think it is important that we discuss these issues because they are so prevalent in our culture. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of cultural and contextual background on the myths of Kali Beheaded and Callisto and Arcus, uh, and hopefully this works the second time around, because the first one didn't. Um, so just, again, if you have questions, if you're having difficulties with this, please let me know, and I will try to accommodate however I can. Uh, I want to start by discussing the myth of Kali Beheaded. Now, uh, in Western culture, Kali is probably the best known of the Hindu deities, of which there are 33 million. That's not an exaggeration. There are actually that many Hindu deities. Very complex religion. Um, and Kali is, is every bit as complex and fascinating as all of them. In fact, uh, one student emailed me, uh, sort of rightfully upset, that Kali is only portrayed in this very limited fashion in this particular myth. Um, she is quite complex and often misunderstood. That crappy Indiana Jones movie didn't help. <laughs> and she has some qualities that often she is more powerful than the rest of the gods. Kali is definitely the ultimate death goddess in terms of being about destruction, in terms of being about uh, creating space for new things to exist. And that's that's often how destruction is seen within the context of Hinduism. Um, and we can certainly see elements of that in her story, Kali Beheaded. Um, she's not typically seen as, as passive as we see in this story. And this is a classic example of why face-to-face -face instruction is inherently better, because we could have a full conversation about this um, that we can't have in this sort of one-way model of instruction here. Um, one of the other things that's often misunderstood by Westerners about Hindu culture is the and Indian culture generally is the caste system. Uh, and the, in the story, Kali violates the caste system by hanging out with the unclean. Um, and Westerners don't like this idea. We like to believe in social mobility, that you can start at the bottom and work your way up, uh, whether or not that is actually possible. Um, one of the best resources for discussing the caste system that I have found is a book called The World's Religions by Houston Smith. Uh, it's a little older text, but it, it has a pretty detailed and thorough explanation of the caste system and how, uh, again, one of the issues Westerners have is there's no sense of vertical justice. Uh, that is, if you are a, a member of upper society and you commit a crime to someone below you in the caste system, nothing happens. Thankfully, we don't have anything like that here in America, right? Um, but there is a kind of horizontal justice. So if you're a member of the untouchable class and commit a crime against someone above you, uh, you're not likely to get any kind of real justice. But there is within your own caste a sort of jury of peers. Uh, again, very complex. I'm trying to minimize this to only what we absolutely need for understanding the story. Um, but the caste system is, like Kali, a lot more complex than perhaps we've been led to believe. One of the main reasons uh, I'm teaching this story is because it really highlights a lot of the cultural attitudes that we deal with related to sex workers. Uh, in the story, Kali is beheaded, obviously, and the gods regret this and find the first body that has the same birthmark as hers. Uh, and it turns out to be the body of a prostitute. Uh, had the same birthmark. Um, and what I think is interesting is the body corrupts the head. Uh, the head does not somehow empower the body. Uh, and this creates what has often been called the goddess whore dichotomy. That, you know, either, and, and I think a lot of the women uh, in our course will probably understand this, we'll, might have even heard some variation of it, where you're either the untouchable goddess or a filthy prostitute. Um, and, you know, this is, this is often the attitude of patriarchy. Either, you know, you're untouchable uh, because you are so divine, I've got to keep you on this pedestal, or you are uh, a filthy being of the flesh. Um, 
And we see a lot of these ideas play out in attitudes towards sex workers. Sex workers uh, often don't report the number of sexual assaults that they have because they're more likely to be arrested than believed by law enforcement. Um, we, we see this in uh, a student shared some years ago about a pornographic actress who was applying to live in an apartment and the manager of that apartment complex recognized her, complimented her on her work, and then rejected her application because we can't have sex workers living here. That'll destroy our reputation. Um, a few years ago at a different school, a student of mine, a, a guy in his mid-50s, uh, wanted to write about the topic of legalizing prostitution, which I think is absolutely legitimate and important. Um, he started off as kind of a, you know, joking, hey, well, you know, I can finally get laid. Um, I, I sent him some articles. This is a, a topic I'm interested in for very different reasons, um, namely to get sex workers the protection of the law uh, that they have in other countries. But I, I sent him an article about a woman in Amsterdam who has been a professional sex worker for 25 years or better, uh, wants to get out of it finds that it is impossible to get out of it and has to hide her profession from her own children because of the cultural stigma still associated with sex work. Um, and again, we see in the myth that the body is ultimately what leads Kali down this path of destruction uh, because her head has been corrupted by the body instead of being purified by the head of a goddess. Um, and there, there. This is a continuing issue. Uh, sex work is, the, the onus is always on the sex worker, never on the people who create the demand for the sex work. Uh, and I think it's very important that we, we study this story and get a sense of the stigma that is associated with this very difficult and dangerous profession that is often written off as a joke. Um, for example, in the very famous play, The Doll, A Dollhouse, uh, the main character jokes about, well, you know, if I need money, I can just always fall back into sex work. Um, and that is a, an attitude that we have often seen in a number of cultural contexts, uh, per further perpetuating the stigma that our society has against sex workers. In the other story, the story of Callisto and Arcus, um, providing a little more context on Roman history. It's quite frankly disturbing how often uh, rape is an element of Roman history. Uh, in, the, in the sort of two various creation myths for the Roman Empire, uh, the story of uh, the Vestal Virgin in your uh, introductory material, uh, who is raped by Mars, the god of war, uh, and then is killed for that because she dared to have the audacity to be sexually assaulted. Um, Romulus and Remus are then raised by uh, a former sex worker. Uh, and in the other very famous creation story of Rome, uh, Romulus and Remus found the city uh, on the seven hills of Rome and realized we don't have any women. And so they invite the neighboring Sabine tribe to join them for a feast at which they rape all of the women and take them as their wives. Uh, even the founding of the Roman Republic uh, has its origins in a rape story, unfortunately. Uh, the tyrant king Tarquin rapes Lucrece, the daughter of a Roman aristocratic family. Uh, Shakespeare writes about this in one of his long narrative poems, ironically composed during a plague outbreak. Um, and it was actually the thing that kicked off the Roman Republic, that kicked off uh, representative government in this culture. Um, and ultimately, it speaks to the disturbing amount of sexual assault that was common in the Roman Empire, in the Roman Republic, in Roman history. Uh, and in many ways, this story feels very contemporary. Uh, I've had a number of students comment on the fact that a lot of what goes on in the story is precisely how victims of sexual assault are treated today. Uh, Callisto after she is sexually assaulted, feels great shame and, and is depressed. Uh, this is a tragically common experience for victims of sexual assault. They feel as if it is somehow their fault. 
Um, it never is. Callisto is then shamed and ostracized from the closest thing she has to a family, Diana's virginal huntresses. Uh, what's especially disturbing is at one point in the text, the goddesses or the goddesses uh, followers see her demeanor and recognize what has happened. And then when it is revealed that Callisto is pregnant, they further perpetuate that assault. They kick her out of their community and isolate her. Again, a tragically common experience for victims of sexual assault. Um, making matters worse, Juno, who is Hera in Greek mythology, is uh, the representative of earthly law and order, of the legal system, and she further brutalizes and traumatizes Callisto and quite literally takes her voice away, uh, disempowering her in much the same way that law enforcement often fails to believe victims of sexual assault. Uh, on, in terms of rape cases that actually go to trial, only about 18% of them actually end in conviction, which is a horribly depressing number and might give us some insight into why rape is a tragically underreported crime. The statistics are absolutely horrifying. Um, I've seen as few as one in five women will be sexually assaulted at some point in their life, um, as high as one in three. Um, Men certainly also can fall victim to this, and those numbers are even harder to come by. I've seen conservatively as low as 1 in 10, as high as 1 in 6 for men, uh, and those numbers are even harder to find because of the social stigma that men are supposed to enjoy this process. Um, yeah, uh, Thankfully, a lot of these attitudes are beginning to shift and change. Um, the Me Too movement has had great success. Uh, not as much as it needs, but, you know, progress is a game of inches. Um, Brock Turner, the douchebag who raped a girl because she was there and was then, you know, basically given no sentence because the judge didn't want to ruin this young man's life. Never mind that he destroyed a young woman's life. Uh, that judge was later recalled specifically by California voters because of that decision. Uh, Harvey Weinstein, who uh, dominated the film industry for 20, 25 years, uh, held tremendous sway over the careers of various actresses, was recently convicted of several charges of rape and faces up to 20 plus years in prison. Um, these are good things. It is, it is worth celebrating those developments. Um, and yet it's still, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, there are a lot of movements toward taking rape and sexual assault much more serious. And uh, we should applaud those on a more local level. And I hope none of you ever need these services uh, on the Auraria campus. Um, the Phoenix Center uh, does a lot of work for victims of interpersonal violence, not just sexual assault and rape, uh, but certainly they will work with uh, victims to go to the police, to go to court. They do a lot of really brilliant work with victim advocacy, uh, and we should applaud that work. Uh, there's still very much left to be done to correct the horrors of rape culture in the United States and around the rest of the world, uh, but we must never lose sight of the fact that there are people who are doing good work. Uh, I hope that this brief lecture will help provide some context to those stories and perhaps some understanding. Uh, if you do have questions still, uh, or comments that you would like to make, or if you would like to know more about the resource available in the Phoenix Center, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I'll be happy to try and provide some help for you. And hopefully all the rest of our video lectures will not be quite so dark and dismal. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you're all safe and well, and uh, hope to see you again soon.